Good evening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Terry Paggi. Uh, I am with the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. We are the uh, uniformed all-volunteer force multiplier of the United States Coast Guard. Um, as volunteers, we can uh, we are allowed to participate in any missions that the active duty Coast Guard can, uh, with the exception of combat and law enforcement. So um, a little preface about uh, the boating safety. Um, right after World War II, the economy started doing well and people had a lot of extra money and recreational boating really took off. Um, it was fairly inexpensive. And um, the one, however, the one thing that uh, they did start to see was that there were a high number of uh, fatalities and injuries related to boating uh, accidents. And it got to be so bad that in 1971, Congress passed the Safe Boating Act, uh, which required uh, the US Coast Guard to provide uh, um, boating education uh, to boaters and to also provide uh, um, vessel safety checks and um, other educational uh, type of uh, uh, arenas. Um, the, the, the bulk of this fell onto the US Coast Guard Auxiliary because we were probably the best equipped to handle this. Um, the US Coast Guard active duty component is about the size of the New York City Police Department. So, um, um, uh, and, and the actual auxiliary component is about the same size as the active duty. So we are able to do uh, and, and meet uh, a lot more than they are. And this allows them to continue on with, um, you know, more important missions that um, they would handle. So, uh, and what, um, and what I also wanted to say was that, um, Subsequent to the passing of the Safe Boating Act of 1971, uh, they started and boating education and bo um, you know boating safety seminars. They started to see uh, with power boats, sailboats that the um, uh, fatalities and injuries started to decline. Um, 1987, they started tracking paddle craft. It started to get become popular. And uh, the one thing that they did find though is while power boats and sailboats, fatalities and injuries were slowly declining, those involving paddle craft uh, have been steadily increasing. And with the exception of a couple of years, that has been the normal pattern um, since 1987. So we've been really proactive about getting out into the paddle craft community and going over a lot of safety presentations um, and teaming up with the American Canoe Association. So um, the rule of paddling is there are two types of paddlers. Um, this is those that have gone for an unexpected swim and those that are going to go to, for an unexpected swim. Um, if you are paddling um, sooner or later, if you do it long enough, you're gonna go for an unexpected dunking. And we wanna try to provide you with the information that is needed in order for you to um, recover from that and get back in the, in the craft and, and back on the, on the water. So, <clears throat> One of the things uh, I, I'm on a lot of social media looking at other uh, groups around the Midwest where we are located. And uh, one of the biggest questions is people that are new into the sport, um, they will ask, uh, you know, what, what's the best type of kayak to get? What, uh, what is, you know, what do you recommend? And when you ask these types of things on social media, you get just bombarded with different opinions. Um, now, Paddle craft include canoes, kayaks, and stand-up paddle boards, or SUPs. Um, now, while this refers to all types of paddle craft, um, kayaks make up probably well over 80% of paddle craft. So um, I may use the word kayak and paddle craft interchangeably. It's on, I'm not trying to push anybody out. Um, but anyway, um, so 
what, you know, and, and when people ask me what type of craft should I get, and it's, I go, you really should, it depends on where you are going to do the bulk of your paddling. All right. So if you are going to stay completely on uh, inland ponds, small little protected lakes, um, small, slow moving rivers, uh, you know, uh, using a sit on, much like the man at, uh, who's the fisherman in the upper right and the people who are in the tandem uh, two uh, man kayak um, in the middle. Uh, these are, as they say, you sit on top of them. Um, and I'm sorry. I forgot to set my phone off. I'm very apologetic about that. So um, one of the things that um, uh, there's, and each type of craft has a pro and con. They, um, the sit-ons are more stable uh, because they are a little bit wider. Um, they're a little bit easier to get in and out of. Um, because you do not have a cockpit. Um, however, because they are a little bit wider, you have to use some more energy to push them along because they are not as streamlined and um, you would have a little bit harder time keeping up with people who uh, were in a sit-in because of these kayaks being a little bit narrower and a little bit more uh, aerodynamic. So. That being said, the sit-ins, um, these are great for um, going into larger lakes, um, especially if it's a touring kayak or a sea kayak, as some will call them. Um, these uh, are, are a little bit narrower, which makes them easier to paddle. Uh, less, less effort is required, um, but because they are narrower, they are a little bit more susceptible to um, uh, tipping over. And so that's what we're gonna talk to you about a little bit later. Now, one of the things that uh, is probably the, one of the more important things that you can purchase if you have a kayak um, that is a sit-in uh, are these little conical shaped uh, things on, on the lower left. Uh, some people refer to these as flotation bags or flotation cells. Um, and these uh, are, would go into the uh, bow and the stern of your uh, sit-in kayak uh, if you did not have um, sealed bulkheads. Um, you would place these up in front. There's a, you could see the long tube on them and um, you would blow it up just much like a, a beach ball. And uh, in the event that you did tip over, um, these would provide enough buoyancy so that when you tried to enter, re-enter your kayak, um, it would not completely sink underneath you. So that's a, a very important thing uh, if you do not have um, sealed bulkheads. So right here, life jackets, also known as personal flotation devices or PFDs. Um, these are what will save your life, um, especially uh, if you paddle all year round. Um, of all the fatalities that have happened to um, paddle craft people, uh, nine out of 10, uh, Actually, all, all of the um, uh, fatalities were drowning. Um, nine out of the 10 were from them not wearing or not having in their craft a life jacket. Um, the other percentage, the, the one out of 10 um, uh, succumbed to uh, drowning while wearing a, a, a PFD, but they were caught uh, either under a low head spill dam um, or a strainer. And I will show you what that is uh, a little bit later. They should be worn at all times. If you go over um, unexpectedly, 
uh, you will not have the time to grab it and try to put it on. Uh, there's two laws of physics here. The PFD wants to stay on top of the water and your body wants to go down. So putting these on while you are in the water is extremely difficult, is extremely hard. Uh, and you will, if you're by yourself, you're going to end up becoming exhausted um, and it will affect your ability to save yourself. Now, um, pretty much across the country, 13 is the re uh, and under our required ages for um, people to have them on. Um, <clears throat> now, when you buy a, a, a life jacket for a child, um, please don't buy it for them to grow into it. This is something that an expense that you're going to have to pay, you know, every year. Uh, if you buy it, it with the expectation of them going into it, um, they may, if they have to go into the water, they may actually wind up slipping through it and um, drowning. So we strongly urge you to get it fitted so that it is nice and snug. One of the other options that people have are, um, and I'll move this little view box over to the side, <clears throat> is this one right here. And this is an inflatable life jacket. Um, this is a manual inflatable. We, they do have the automatic inflatables, but we do not suggest that you purchase them because they, have, they can uh, inflate when you're not ready for it. Um, <clears throat> these things, um, and I've tried them on, they're very lightweight. You don't even realize that it's on you. Um, they are a little bit pricey, um, but <clears throat> if you find yourself in the water, there's a yellow handle. You just grab and yank on it and it, it, um, a CO2 cartridge will discharge and it'll inflate the vest um, with air. One of the downsides are where um, the regular PFDs are designed to where you will float face up. Um, this is not the case with the uh, inflatables. You have to actually keep yourself face up. Another not, uh, uh, required item is a sound device. A whistle is a great, great tool to have. Um, make sure that if you purchase one, um, you do not get the one with the P in the middle because those are not meant for being in the water. Uh, these are very important because if, if you flip over and it's getting to be dusk, you're going to be sitting and you're going to see a little short video clip here shortly. Um, uh, and you'll see how low somebody sits in water when they're wearing a PFD. And so if it's getting dark out and there are people looking for you and there's some wave action, um, this whistle will help people uh, zero in on you and, and get you rescued. Um, as with many sports, um, you know, there's a ton of stuff that you have to buy uh, along with the thing that you're going to be riding in or loading in, and uh, paddling is no exception. Um, this item right here on the lower left, this is called a spray skirt, and this would be used in a sit-in kayak, which is what you have here. And you would step into this thing and it would look like a skirt. And as you sat in the cockpit of the paddlecraft, uh, you would then secure it around the edges. And so if you were on larger lakes where you were apt to get hit with higher waves uh, or in the oceans, uh, this would keep water from coming and filling in um, inside the cockpit. Um, next to it is the uh, personal flotation device. And next to this uh, is a uh, dry suit. Um, we str uh, strongly, strongly urge that uh, in cold water conditions, and we describe these as that being under 70 degrees Fahrenheit, that you wear a dry suit. Um, the dry suit is not to be confused with a wetsuit. Um, both are protective but the dry suit is better because it keeps the water away from your skin. Uh, whereas a wet suit actually is designed to let water in. And the, um, the premise behind it is that the water is heated by your skin and kept warm by the inside of the wet suit. 
but if something should happen and you're not rescued right away, the um, wetsuit will eventually cool down and kind of defeat the purpose. We always recommend that people carry a second set of paddles. You'd never know when one of yours will break or one of the people that are along with you, theirs will break. So it's always kind of a good idea to have a spare set. You never know. Uh, actually, one of the women that are in our is in our group, um, they stopped on a little island in the middle of the river and didn't secure the one paddle and they were like taking pictures turned around and the paddle was gone. It was, it came loose and went down the river. So they had to end up paddling. Uh, they had to take the other person's paddle and break it in half, not break it, but break it down and uh, kind of use it almost like a canoe paddle. So that'll help you um, prevent that. Now this gray bag right here, this is called a throw bag. And um, what's in, it's inside is a small little weighted bag and it's got uh, usually grounded up lead. Very, it's, you know, only weighs a couple of pounds. Um, but what it does is it allows you to throw a line to somebody who may be in distress. Um, so, uh, you know, if somebody flips over in their kayak or canoe and they're a, a good distance from you and they're in some type of distress, you can reach them without having to get too close to them. Um, in the green bag next to it is a first aid kit. This is, you know, this should be in all boats. Um, nothing ruins a trip uh, worse than having, uh, you know, blisters from uh, paddling, um, being sunburned, um, bee stings, you know, cuts, you know, whatever have you. So you need to be prepared and carrying a first aid kit is, is a good thing to have. Um, up here at the top, there's a black item. It looks like a piece of pipe. There's a yellow one right here. These are bilge pumps. So these are also good to have. You can put stick them underneath your bungee cords, um, especially if you have a sit-in, because if you do flip over, it's gonna fill with water. So once you get back inside, uh, you can put the bilge pump in and start emptying the water out and it'll take nearly all of it out. So this way it's, you'll be light enough to where you can paddle towards shore, get to and uh, pull your uh, kayak out and then turn it over, empty it uh, of completely of the other water. Um, <clears throat> this thing right here in the red uh, is a plastic uh, thing for carrying an extra set of clothes. Uh, even on hot days, if you take a dump and get wet, paddling in wet clothing is not uh, pleasurable, as, even if it's on a hot day. Uh, it you know, can lead to chafing and stuff like that. So at least if you have an extra set of dry clothes, you can paddle towards shore, do a quick change, and then be on your way. One of the other things that is really important to have is footwear. Um, just re keep in mind that wherever you launch or land at, chances are that somebody has been fishing there. So, and wherever people fish, you will find, um, you can find lures, uh, you can find fish hooks, uh, there could be broken glass. So getting into your boat or out of your boat, and if you don't, if you're having in bare feet, you can end up getting caught. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, most of your fishing hooks are barbed. So if you step on one of those, it's not going to come out. You're going to have to uh, go and have it uh, surgically removed because of the barb on there. So it's going to keep it from um, being, being able to be pulled out by itself. Up in the upper right-hand corner. So we recommend, um, these are some things that you would need um, when you're on federal waters. And when we mean by federal waters, we mean those that are like the Great Lakes um, and the oceans. You, you know, uh, besides, um, you know, with the normal uh, stuff, we're, we're looking at personal locator beacons. These things, um, uh, once activated, uh, send out a signal and the Coast Guard can triangulate to see where you're at and uh, be able to send rescue craft out there. We have strobe lights, we have signal flares, um, these can include uh, smoke or the kind that shoot up into the air, um, dive markers, 
Uh, these all make you visible. Also, we have handheld VHF radios. Um, channel 16, you know, having a cell phone is really good, but there's a lot of air at times that you are in dead space and you can't call out. Whereas um, VHF radio on channel 16, all boats monitor that. And so if you were out on a very, very extremely large lake and you got into trouble and you try calling the Coast Guard, but you were too far away, most boats would that had marine radios would be listening to you and they can relay your message uh, of distress. Um, <clears throat> legal requirements. Uh, unfortunately, most states uh, do not require any type of boater education. Uh, specifically for paddlecraft. Um, now, Illinois uh, is changing that. Uh, anybody born after 1998 will have to take a, um, a, an approved boater education course and carry proof of that with them. Um, Illinois no longer requires us to have registration on paddlecraft. Um, however, uh, if you go into certain waters, uh, local municipalities may require you to get some type of um, day use permit or whatever. Okay. Um, also, you can go to americasboatingcourse.com and you can look up and find the particular state that you're in and you could see whether or not there are um, registration requirements. And also, if you're lucky enough to live near a paddlecraft dealer, they are a good source of information um, uh, on this subject. Uh, trip planning. We, we really strongly urge that everybody file a float plan when you're going out, even if you're going out with a group. Um, something can happen. And if people do not know where you're at, how, when you were going, how, what time you were supposed to come back, uh, we really don't know uh, where to begin and start looking for you. Um, on, at the bottom, this is the Coast Guard Auxiliary web page. And uh, if you uh, visit that web page, you will find you have the ability to print out uh, PDF versions of this float plan and you can leave it with uh, a responsible person um, when you go out. And this way, if they know if you don't show up um, uh, at a certain time, um, they can notify the authorities to start looking for you. Getting to the water, this is, uh, presents its own challenges. Um, when you secure your vehicle to your craft, the correct way is like this green SUV up on top. Um, you have it cinched down in the center. Uh, these are J racks, which hold these, these uh, craft um, uh, at a kind of tilted upright. Um, but what is also uh, a, a big requirement is the uh, lines that are affixed to the bow, which is the front of the craft and the stern, which is the rear. Um, if you notice that uh, the lines uh, are tightened down and secured. Um, and so what this does is no matter if you don't have these on, uh, no matter how tight you cinch this thing down, once you start traveling and usually around this 40, 45 miles an hour, your craft will start wobbling. And what this does is it starts to loosen those straps in the middle. And all of a sudden, both your boats are facing outward now. Um, you are responsible. So if that boat, if that kayak, if that stand-up uh, canoe comes off of your, your craft or your car, you are responsible. Um, an incident happened in Iowa last summer where people were, uh, they had a trailer that had several kayaks on it. Um, one of them came loose and it came off and uh, it actually struck a motorcyclist um, behind them and uh, he subsequently uh, passed from his injuries and um, these people that were driving um, I should say the person that was driving um, was um, charged with multiple traffic offenses and I'm sure there's civil litigation involving that so you want to make sure that your your vehicle uh, your craft is uh, secured to your vehicle 
Um, at the water's edge, this is where you want to check to make sure that you have all your equipment. Use a, um, a, a checklist. Don't try to use, you know, from memory. Um, file your float plan. Make sure that the people in your group, um, and we suggest that when people go out, they don't go out by themselves. We we tell people that the, the perfect group number is three, because if one person becomes injured, um, one person could stay with them while the other person goes to either uh, get help from first responders or be able to guide them to where you are actually at. Um, clarify with your group that you know exactly ahead of time what you are going to be doing, okay? How far are you gonna go? Are you gonna take a break? Are, you, um, are there any hazards that you may encounter along your way? Um, make sure you stay off of private property and you know where that's at. Um, so make sure you do all this before you go out onto the water. One of the things that you wanna ask yourself is should I be out here today? The conditions, uh, you know, you may have extremely high winds with high waves. Is this going to be something that is beyond your uh, abilities? Uh, <clears throat> the same thing would be <clears throat> after a, um, a heavy rainstorm uh, on rivers. They can actually, you know, be quite uh, high and they may hide obstructions that would normally be seen. So that's something you should always ask yourself. Uh, there's nothing wrong with turning around and going home. Um, <clears throat> and then if you do decide to go out, do you have a solution if things go wrong? Uh, what are you going to do if you do go over? So when you're, uh, you know, <clears throat> the people on the upper uh, right and lower left, these are using sit on uh, kayaks. These are fairly easy to get in and out of because you're not trying to uh, maneuver through a cockpit. Uh, the upper left and the lower right, uh, these are uh, sit-ins, so, or uh, yes, yeah, sit-ins, and so you should always try to keep at least three points of contact with the craft as you are getting in or out. Uh, make sure that you, you know, are moving with slow. You don't want to do any type of jerky movements. Um, just take your time, slow and methodical. Um, once you get one foot out, then you <clears throat> maintain your hand uh, position and you can sling the other one out and, and then up. And then the same thing is just in reverse for going in. So um, just remember to be slow and methodical. These are common paddlecraft signals. You're going to be out on the water quite a bit and um, it's going to be very hard to hear with the, the wind. You have other boats out there. Uh, you have who knows what other types of noises. Um, knowing just these several um, types of signals. Uh, so if you're far enough away where you can't understand them, uh, you can get a gist for what's going on and you can either uh, render aid or assistance or you know everything's a-okay so this would be one that you know if you wanted to take a screenshot right now and save it for another uh, reference it's a, a good thing to do so okay <clears throat> situational awareness um, this is one thing that you should always um, be aware is of your surroundings now um, unfortunately, um, boating has become no different than uh, driving when it comes to having distracted drivers. You will find people on boats that will be looking at text messages that will be texting. They will be taking selfies. Um, one of the um, main causes of accidents among power boats is failure to observe and failure to have a uh, person watching for hazards. Um, I tell people, please don't ever wear headsets or earbuds when you're out there on the water. As much as it is nice to listen to music, um, it can prevent you from hearing a powerboat or a, or a jet ski coming uh, down on you. They may not see you. And if you can hear them, at least you, it gives you some time to possibly get out of their way. Um, 
you can see the paddler uh, in the, the photo. Um, you know, he's wearing bright colors. He's got a, a bright uh, yellow uh, paddle. Um, he's doing everything possible to make himself uh, visible. Um, that being said, uh, kayaks and even the stand-ups, you present a very low silhouette. So, you know, depending on uh, the wave activity, depending on the angle of the sun, whether or not the person that's in the powerboat or the personal watercraft is wearing sunglasses, you know, they may or may not see you. And then there's always the people that are distracted. So um, it's even though paddle craft have the right of way over powerboats, um, it's, it's always be, uh, better to be alive and be defensive rather than uh, trying to uh, argue about right of way. And again, here's one of the biggest things that's gonna get people's attention is the paddle flash. Uh, the motion of the paddle, you'll have water that's going to be reflecting, it almost acts like a mirror, and the clothing that you wear. Try to wear stuff that is, you know, the chartreuse yellow, the bright fluorescent orange, something that's bright and that's going to, you know, be able to be seen by uh, boaters. Um, one of the things is the crossing, uh, cr uh, closing distance uh, between power boats. Um, you know, if you're out on rivers where uh, we, we tell people stay out of the channels, stay to the side. Um, and if you cross, have to cross the channel, make sure you do it at a 90 degree turn and look both ways before you start to do that. And uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a, uh, uh, an example here, you know, a quarter mile, it only takes a boat 30 miles, uh, 30 seconds to, uh, at 30 miles an hour. And if they're doing 60, if they're really hauling, um, it's like 15 seconds. So this is the time that you have to uh, make your decision and hopefully that they see you and have time uh, to react. Here. Emergencies, these, are, <clears throat> these can happen at any time. Um, one, the first summer of the pandemic, uh, an individual uh, north of Chicago bought a kayak and it was not the type that should have been taken out on Lake Michigan. But it was a nice warm summer day and um, young man took his craft out for the first time. He, he did have a personal flotation device with him the, and he was wearing the life jacket, uh, but he was dressed for summer weather and um, the t-shirt, shorts, sandals. Lake Michigan stays cold. Uh, once you're, you know, if you're not right along the shoreline uh, and you get out some, um, it's not uncommon for that water to be in the 50 degree range, even in the middle of summer. And uh, this is one of those lakes, just like the ocean, you need to check for the weather report. This individual uh, obviously didn't because it was really, it was just a small light breeze when he took out um, uh, in, uh, on his trip. Well, a little bit later, the wind shifted out of the Southwest and really picked up to about 30 miles an hour. And so when he got tired and started to turn around, um, he found that he was unable to paddle against that real strong wind. And being the first time out, he quickly became exhausted and he was then found himself being pushed further and further and further out into the middle of Lake Michigan. And um, just about sunset, the, um, he was spotted by a, um, a power boater who notified the Coast Guard and they sent a, uh, a rescue craft out of Wilmette uh, Station and they found the individual, you know, he was five miles offshore so um, even if he would not have went into the water, he probably would have passed, uh, passed away from hypothermia, uh, from being out there on the cold air. Um, <clears throat> there's also human induced, uh, you know, do not, please do not drink before you go out and paddle. It's a sport, uh, alcohol dehydrates you and you wanna be hydrated. So um, it can cause problems. As far as drugs, think of medication. Uh, if you're taking any type of medication, um, because this is actual physical activity, 
maybe check with your doctor to see if the medication that you're taking, um, if there's any problem with engaging in the physical sport. There's accidents or illnesses. Um, I, uh, actually, last year in Chicago, uh, on the Chicago River, there was a uh, two people in a uh, canoe. And uh, it appears that the man had uh, possibly a heart attack and he fell over and it took his wife with him and um, she was able to swim to shore, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't. And the divers found him later um, that afternoon. Um, they did not have any PFDs either on them or in the craft. Um, we, we preach often that you should practice self and team rescues. Uh, a team rescue would be where another kayaker uh, would help you uh, get back into your craft. It, it does take uh, some getting used to, and it's not one of these things you just do once and figure I, I know how to do it. And it should be done several times a year and done every year. Um, because as we age, um, we um, the body doesn't quite respond as it used to. So you want to know what your limitations are. And um, actually going on right now, if you're interested, uh, uh, I think up in Naperville, um, every Sunday through the end of March, uh, if you have a kayak, you can go up to one of their uh, high school pools, and I think they charge like $15. Uh, if you want to use one of their kayaks, uh, I think they charge like $5 uh, for that, and you can practice falling out and then trying to get back in. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time. You want to do this before you fall for real, then not uh, one of those things that you find out how to do in an emergency. Okay, after the problem, okay, what I'm going to do is kind of drag this down here a little bit. So after the problem, <clears throat> um, accident reports. And just like cars, when there's a certain uh, dollar threshold in property damage, you are required to uh, file an accident report. Now, uh, here in Illinois, uh, if the damage is $2,000 or more, you are required to uh, file an accident report. And it, while it does seem <clears throat> a lot of money for uh, a paddle craft, um, there are quite a few of these um, uh, uh, seagoing or ocean kayaks, touring kayaks that are fiberglass. And um, you know you get struck by a personal watercraft, aka jet ski, or a powerboat. Um, you can very easily do twenty five hundred, three thousand, or more dollars damage. So you are required to file a report. Uh, you can file it either with the Coast Guard. You can file it with the Department of uh, um, Illinois Conservation Police or your local sheriff's office or local PD, depending on whose waters you're in. Um, also, um, it probably stands without reason. Anytime there's an injury or a fatality, those also have to be reported. And then also check for your local rules, because while the state may have one threshold, your local area may have another. So they want to know about if anybody had any types of injuries on their water. <clears throat> now, after your trip, hopefully you had some fun. Um, plan on doing it again and to keep learning. It is a learning experience. Um, one of the things that is probably the least fun to do is clean your gear when you get home. Uh, chances are you're gonna be really kind of tired and you just wanna take a shower and just relax. But uh, cleaning right from the get-go, uh, one, it's done. And number two is it's easier to do once you do it uh, in the beginning. Um, we always worry about um, invasive species. So if you take your craft into one body of water, you may have picked up some type of plant or uh, maybe uh, fish or some type of amphibian eggs. And the next place you go into may not have that, that type of species of uh, plant or animal life. So you may be uh, you may be transporting and in place, placing an invasive species that then disrupts the whole ecosystem of the next body of water that you're going into. Um, we ask that people. It's easier to clean your stuff right away 
uh, use soap that's um, uh, a non-phosphate. Um, it's specially made to uh, protect the environment. So uh, a lot of you know detergents and stuff have uh, petroleum in it. And you know if you don't completely rinse it off and it's very hard to, uh, the next time you go into water, that petroleum will then go into the water itself. Um, and then if you multiply that by thousands of other paddlers who may be doing the same thing, um, you can end up really harming the animal and plant life that's in there. Uh, your PFDs are, are usually having, uh, they usually have some type of cloth exterior. Uh, don't leave those in your trunk. Um, when you get home, hang them up. Uh, let them air dry. Uh, you can let them air dry in your bathroom, on the shower head, uh, in, your, um, in your garage. Do not place them in the sun, direct sunlight, because that will uh, in, uh, accelerate uh, the, um, the PFD to dry rot. So um, just let it air dry because, uh, uh, you know, even one lady I saw on one of her face, she left hers wet inside her kayak and that was like on a saturday and then went to go retrieve it on monday and it was kind of hot and humid and it already had mildewed so it, it she had to get rid of it because it stunk to high heaven and um it was a very expensive learning experience um stand-ups um we we do talk about them they're probably one of the least popular of the paddle craft um but because some people do use them, we, we do talk about them. And just like any other type of paddle craft, you know, there's types that are built for people and places where they're going to be paddling. And if you notice the individual on uh, the left, uh, the young man there, he's clearly on a board that is um, not big enough for him. He's pretty much underwater. He doesn't have uh, any type of um, footwear on to keep him from slipping. Um, he doesn't have a leash on. So if he falls into the water, his craft um, will uh, not be near him. And he's not wearing any type of PFD. I think somebody. OK. Right. Okay. I would just talk about the um, about the zebra mussels and and being the invasive species, and they're very very hard to see. So very correct. Uh, thank you. Um, last year, um, okay. Each August, the Coast Guard puts out its annual boating report. So last year in 2021, we got the numbers for 2020, and um, Nationwide, there were 10 fatalities uh, for stand-up paddle uh, boards, you know, paddlers. Um, all 10 were not wearing any type of flotation device. Mark Sabo. Um, we're not wearing any type of flotation device. Now, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, we can see the young lady there. She's clearly on a board that, um, uh, is can carry her weight. She's wearing foot gear on there that um, uh, will keep her from slipping and losing her balance. She's also wearing a leash. So if she goes over on the side, um, it, she's going to be close to her craft. She'll be able to get back to it. And then around her waist is a, a, a manually inflatable uh, life jacket. So if she were to go into the water, it's you just pull it up, goes over your head, and then you can see the handle on her right, your left on the photo, and you just give it a yank and it would inflate. Um, the rules for most paddle craft are the same. Um, you know, you should wear a life jacket and carry a whistle. Uh, be a competent swimmer. Um, uh, you know, people, as we get older, we forget. We always look out through our eyes and think we're always 18. And, you know, um, we get older and we don't quite um, uh, have the same physical ability that we did as when we were younger. 
So it, it is uh, something that uh, takes some time to get used to. And, um, you know, at some of your health clubs, they have, you know, the use of the pools, um, start swimming laps to, to build up your, your, your endurance a bit. Uh, know how to self-rescue. It's also a good idea to know how to tow another board. Uh, one of the things with any type of paddle craft is somebody could develop some type of shoulder injury and then they can't get back. So it's always nice to have a tow rope and to you know be able to secure it to the other craft and uh, tow them back. If you're going out, um, it could because a lot of times like when I give these classes, people are in the um, near the oceans and stuff. So they have to be worried about, uh, concerned about um, beach hazards such as wind, tidal range, the current and everything else. Uh, know when to wear a leash. So around here, you would wear one all the time. It's just when you are in the surf that you would not want to wear one because it, you, you, it, uh, it would almost make it like a boomerang. And if it came back and struck you, um, it can have uh, some disaster results. Um, be defensive. Um, don't go where you're not supposed to and avoid swimmers, boaters, and other paddle boarders. Um, and then also make sure that you're using uh, the proper blade angle that is uh, best for your type of paddling um, um, type. You know, uh, some people are very, uh, have different techniques and there are different blades that make them more efficient. So um, always, you know, you can go to any type of um, paddle craft place um, and speak with a professional and they would be able to fit you up with the type of paddle that would be best suited for you. Kayak fishing, this is another um, very popular sport. Um, these are all sit in, I'm sorry, sit on uh, kayaks. Um, the things that you have to be more concerned about with these is that <clears throat> you are going to have fishing line out, you're going to have hooks on it. And you want to make sure that <clears throat> if you do fall overboard, that you are free of um, being wrapped up in these. Also, um, do not um, wear any type of, uh, and we see people that are fishing uh, and they are in deep water and they are wearing uh, waders uh, or, or high boots. Uh, if you go in the water and you are trying to get back into your craft, uh, these, fish, these uh, boots uh, will become weights and prevent you from getting back in. And the 10 top safety tips are they're pretty much almost identical to all the other ones. Um, it, it's basically the big thing is wear a life jacket, take a you know, safety course and obey the rules of the road. Even though you're on the water, there are certain navigational things that you should know. Um, you know, the basics of um, uh, 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 navigational aids. Um, you know, what does, when something is painted green or there's a green light, what does that mean versus red uh, or, you know, um, and if you're not aware of that, um, I will tell you that green means that it is the starboard or right hand side of something. Red means it's the left or the port side of something. So if you see a boat coming at you and it's after dark and um, you want to make sure that you stay to the left or right of the craft and not go in between the red and green lights. Um, the same thing for bridges. If you look on top of bridges, you'll see red and green lights and it tells the boat operators what's the um, starboard side of the wall and then what's the uh, port side so that way they don't strike it in the middle of the night. These are something that we offer uh, for free. You will. Um, one of the things I, I try to tell people is wherever you're at, find your local Coast Guard flotilla and you can go to the, our website and you could put in your zip code and you will find the name of your closest flotilla. We would love to have you join, but if you didn't want to join, you can follow them on their various social media platforms and you will see where 
because I know on ours, we, we put out where we are going to be. So if on Saturday, if we're going to be out at, you know, Wayland Lake up in Naperville or the Rookery or the Moni Reserve uh, Reservoir, um, you know, we put that out there so people know. And, you know, we will give these out to people um, so that they can place them on their craft. Um, last year, the Coast Guard spent about $49 million looking for individuals who, um, uh, it, you know, because of um, they found boats that were abandoned and they had no type of way of knowing who they belonged to. So we tell people, place these um, inside your craft, if possible. It helps protect it from fading quickly and it helps uh, protect it from being rubbed off by something. Um, a, a good Sharpie pen uh, will be waterproof. It, it works well with these. Put your phone number on and a phone number of uh, another person. And so if we, you know, if somebody finds a boat and it's abandoned, they're gonna call the first name on the phone uh, first phone under the, under the name. And um, if that person answers and, you know, and we can reunite them with their boat, that's great. But if nobody answers and we call the second person and they say, oh, you know, he went out on the Illinois River and he's kayaking and we have an empty boat. Now we have a, a search and rescue mission. So, um, and then we start mobilizing the troops. So um, help us, you know, conserve our resources to be used, you know, when they should be, um, and also get your equipment back to you. Uh, one of the things that we do offer is it's is a free app. It's for um, both the iOS and Android. Um, it's if you just put in the word Coast Guard, it's uh, a nice uh, free app. It's the first one that pops up. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you can do from here is you can list your your boat um so and and very few people are, are aware of this but each craft no matter how big um it is has what is called a, a hull identification number which is very similar to a vin number in a car and this is one thing that um Oh, okay. Um, this is, I'm sorry, went backwards. This is one thing that um, <clears throat> will identify your craft. Uh, just like in a car, um, we could tell, you know, uh, who, what kind of make, model, um, uh, the date it was made, and the sequence it was made in. So you can add up to three of the craft uh, on this app. Uh, I actually, of mine, I took photos of them and uploaded them too. And so this way, if my boats ever come up missing, I can, when I re uh, re need to report it to the police, they also have the HIN number, which would um, prove my ownership. So um, it, because if they don't have the HIN number, you know, a bunch of people can own the same type of craft I own. But um, this way I can get the, uh, uh, my ownership uh, acknowledged. Okay, I'm just sorry, just reading the, all right. Um, you also can get uh, weather. You can check for water, um, the uh, water issues um, and there's aids to navigation. Uh, also this little thing down here, that says emergency assistance. You can press that once and it's gonna make you press a second time under a second screen so it won't be accidentally done and it'll put you right in touch with the US Coast, the nearest US Coast Guard station. So um, it's, it's a great thing to have uh, with you when you're out there paddling on the water. Um, paddle sports, and it's, it's really growing. It's, it's by leaps and bounds. Um, I think that probably with the pandemic, uh, this 2018 number is probably way low. Uh, it's probably about closer to 30 million right now uh, that own paddle craft. So a lot of people out there. One of the big things, uh, a lot of times people want to go and find the cheapest boat out there. And Sometimes it's a way to spend money that unnecessarily. And I'm, I was guilty of that. I, I bought a craft off of Amazon 
I didn't, um, I didn't, this is before I got involved in all this stuff and I didn't really realize it. And I went out with a bunch of people at a local lake and they, somebody took pictures. And um, when I was looking at them, I didn't realize how low I sat in the water. Um, I'm 6'2", 225. So I went and started looking at the specs on the boat. It had a maximum load capacity of 285 pounds. And a good rule of thumb is, is that you should not exceed 75% of the weight cap, uh, capacity. This allows for any, you know, um, mistakes. So because the load capacity has to take in your, not only your body weight, but the weight of your clothing, the weight of any supplies that you have, uh, extra stuff. Um, because when people took those photos and I saw how low I was sitting in the water, I realized I'd made a big mistake. Um, and so then I had to go buy another boat and then I sold the smaller one that was too small for me and um, ended up losing a lot of money on it. So probably had I went and well, went to a, a, a store that dealt in paddlecraft, I would have been instructed uh, and schooled on uh, what to look for. Um, also, I, we, we, we suggest that a lot of people, um, if you have the ability, because there are places that rent these uh, craft, uh, Moni Reservoir is one uh, locally, uh, Wayland Lake uh, up in the Naperville Bowling Brook area, uh, Tampier Lake and Orland Park, they all rent these. And you could try different types of boats and see what do you want. Do you like to sit in? Do you like to sit on? Um, you know, and you could see what, you know, uh, how they react out on the open water. So, and it's a very inexpensive way to do it rather than buying something and then find out a couple of weeks later that you're really not thrilled with it. Also, when you buy at the big box stores, most of the time you are going to be sold something by somebody who has really never been in one of these. So it's, it's really hard for them to give you any type of instruction on what to look for. Now, um, 1987, this is when they started looking at paddle craft fatalities um, separate from power boats. So you could see in 1987, we had 78 fatalities. And for the most part, steadily going up, 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 up. There were a few years that there were some dips. Um, but last um, 19, or I'll say 2020, we had 164 fatalities, which was the second highest year since 1987. Um, unfortunately, I think when the 2021 report comes out in August, um, I think 2021 will probably be the worst year yet. Uh, it was very bad last year nationwide. Now, this chart will tell you a little bit more to more for detail. The green line are standups, the burgundy line are canoe fatalities, and the red is kayaks. Um, and again, kayaks are the most prevalent paddle craft out there. So the numbers are going to be higher. Um, the numbers along the bottom are the ages of the people who are involved in these fatalities. Um, now, <clears throat> You can see being more popular, um, the 19 to 29 year range in just about all of them are at peak um, in canoes and kayaks. Um, we don't know really why. It, you know, it could be just the youth and experience. Uh, you know, thinking that nothing bad is going to happen to them. Um, because if you look at the, the year prior and the year prior to that, the year prior to that, um, we see the same spikes, okay? It's the 19 to 29 years uh, ranges are, that are usually the, the deadliest. Okay, this is just a um, short film. It's about eight minutes long, but it, it does go into uh, uh, some really good detail about um, cold water and how really dangerous it is. Hi, 
Hi, fellow paddlers. I'm Moulton Avery, founder and director of the National Center for Cold Water Safety. This video will show you why falling into cold water without the protection of a wetsuit or dry suit is an extremely dangerous situation and also why cold shock, swimming failure, and incapacitation frequently result in rapid drowning, even for people who are considered good swimmers. Cold water is a lethal environment, but it's so well camouflaged that you can stand right next to it and see absolutely nothing dangerous, just a sparkling invitation to get out on the water and have some fun. Cold water sets a perfect trap for any paddler who doesn't take it seriously. Whether you're a relatively new paddler like kayak fisherman Nicholas Brunner, who died on June 12, 2020 in the Pacific Ocean off Trinidad, California, or a seasoned veteran with plenty of experience like North Face founder and conservationist Doug Tompkins, who died on December 8, 2015, while kayaking with friends on a cold lake in Patagonia, Chile. If you're not prepared for immersion, you're risking your life. Most people have no idea that falling into cold water is a life-threatening situation. That's because cold water doesn't look dangerous at all. It doesn't even sound dangerous to most people. If you say 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius water to someone, they mentally compare it to 50 Fahrenheit air, which doesn't sound very cold. But there's a huge difference between the way that air and water feel. Because water is much denser than air, it feels much colder, and it conducts heat away from your skin much faster than air does. For example, 45 Fahrenheit air feels cold, but 45 Fahrenheit water feels like it's burning your skin. As soon as cold water touches a large area of your body, like your chest, for example, it triggers cold shock, a life-threatening reaction that causes you to completely lose control of your breathing. Suddenly, you're gasping and hyperventilating, you can't hold your breath, and you feel like you're suffocating. Regular clothing offers almost no protection when you fall into cold water because it doesn't keep the water away from your skin. When you're neck deep in cold water, even in flat calm conditions, and with the added buoyancy of a type 3 life jacket, the kind that most paddlers wear, your nose is only three inches above the water. And if your breathing is out of control, if you're gasping and hyperventilating, you have a perfect recipe for inhaling water and suddenly drowning. And that danger is even greater if the water's rough and waves are splashing your face. Many people who've heard about cold shock think it involves just a gasp. But this isn't an ordinary gasp, the kind you'd have if someone startled you. Cold shock gasps are full lung inflations. It's like suddenly taking a huge breath of air that totally fills your lungs, and this usually happens multiple times in a row, one gasp after another, and it's totally out of your control. If your mouth happens to be underwater when you gasp, you're going to drown. That's how fast it can happen. Cold shock also causes swimming failure, and if you're not wearing a life jacket, you have almost no chance of surviving. Accident reports of people briefly struggling in cold water before suddenly drowning are very common. They're also supported by drowning statistics, which show that many people who were considered to be good swimmers when swimming in warm water were unable to swim as little as six to 10 feet in cold water, even to save their own lives. Now we're gonna look at a video of volunteers trying to swim a short distance in 45 Fahrenheit water without PFDs. They experience cold shock, swimming failure, and incapacitation. In real life, one of them would have drowned within 15 feet. Another barely made it 20 yards before his arms gave out. When you watch this, remember that it was filmed in a controlled setting. Multiple rescue swimmers were in the water with the volunteers. One of the volunteers is Mario Vitoni. Mario is an international marine safety consultant. He's also extremely determined and fit, a recently retired U.S. Coast Guard rescue swimmer. Even so, it took everything he had to reach shore, and he could barely stand when his feet touched bottom. Another thing I want you to notice is what the rescue swimmers are wearing. They're definitely dressed for immersion. They had to spend a lot of time in that water while the video was being filmed, and you don't see them struggling or grimacing. They're just fine. 
no problem dealing with it at all. can't breathe like you have no control but i think with the rescue swimmer calling me down at some point like your body just goes numb Rescue swimmer hadn't been there. What, what do you think would have happened? I probably would have panicked. And then what? Like it took about a minute, minute and a half to get over that time for them letting the uh, skin start to show up from cold to a little number. And then I got hurt, burning kind of pain. So I could go over there. I thought I didn't think I'd be able to stand up. For more information, I invite you to visit our website. That's where you'll find the five golden rules of cold water safety, a set of guidelines that we developed after analyzing hundreds of close calls and fatalities. Okay. Okay, so let me see here. I'm trying to Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I was reading the question. I just thought somebody had one. Okay. Um just some of the uh, quickly here some of the symptoms of um uh of suffering from cold before hypothermia, hypothermia causes the you know death, whereas this is prior to this, but you're gonna have um, a loss of feeling in your hands and feet. You're gonna have a diminished mental skill. Um, people that are close to hypothermia, they have, um, it, it, it's almost like when dealing with them, uh, it's like speaking to somebody who's under the influence of some type of drug or alcohol, um, they have slurred speech, sometimes blurred vision. Um, they cannot move their hands or feet uh, and an uncontrollable shivering. Um, then comes unconsciousness, then a coma, and then um, unfortunately death. So um, this is something that we uh, 
really strongly urge people to this is uh, not go out on to cold water uh, without being dressed for immersion and wearing uh, a life life jacket. This kind of gives you um, a little bit of an idea. I'm trying to find a way to, uh, <clears throat> but these are what the temperatures are and how you should dress. And so while the hypothermia risk is low, um, you can really perish from hypothermia after being in water for an extended period of time, uh, pretty much no matter what the temperature is. Um, but you could see that, you know, once we start uh, going into the water temperatures of below 60, you really need to be considered wearing either a wetsuit or a dry suit. And then once below 50 degrees, a dry suit is highly, highly recommended. Um, again, this kind of gives you, it's a very liberal chart. Uh, if you were to go into cold water and how long you would have to be able, be able to survive it. Um, and now, if you notice though, uh, down here at the 70, 80 degree mark, um, you could still succumb to hypothermia because your body is roughly, you know, 98 and a half degrees. So if your core starts going below 90 degrees, um, you can start going, having uh, organ failure. And once that starts happening, um, then it's just going to be a matter of time uh, before you succumb to hypothermia. So, you know, yes, it is warm water at 80 degrees. Um, but if you were out there for an extended period of time, say you fell off of a boat, um, it can, you can still perish from hypothermia. Um, if you do find yourself outside your boat unexpectedly, um, because water, as you saw in the movie, removes heat faster than air, I mean, uh, from your body faster than the air, um, you want to get as much of your body out of the water as possible. You should swim only if you're very close to land. Um, swimming uses up a lot of exertion, which uses up body heat. Um, stay with your boat. It is much easier to spot somebody uh, with their craft than it is to spot them alone um, in, in just being out there um, with, with just a life jacket on. Um, I had mentioned, I would used the phrase strainer, and this is what uh, a strainer is, is up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, these happen a lot, um, especially what we call it the deadly season. It's usually like April through June when we have heavy um, downpours. And um, what happens is, is that uh, these are obstructions that would normally be seen and avoided when the water level is normal, but when it's raised, they may not be seen um, and the boat hits them and the force of the water pushes the individual under. So there's times of where I said that, um, you know, uh, people did drown while wearing a PFD, the strainer would be one of those times because the water force is so strong, it's pushing you down and it's not allowing the PFD to do its job. The other time is when um, you have these low head dams. Uh, sometimes individuals will go off of them thinking that they're on some type of uh, white water river and the rolling of the water down there, once you're stuck in that, it just keeps you down and pushes you down. Um, and it, it, somebody's gotta go in there after you. So those are one of the few times that you won't, uh, drown while wearing a PFD. So again, we always tell people if the water's high, don't go. All right. You can always go to a lake and have some fun paddling where the, the water height doesn't really matter much. Uh, but in moving water, it does. Uh, again, you can go to our website, you can request a free vessel safety check. Um, this is the form that we use. Um, for most things, uh, if you have three things, you will you will pass our safety check. 
and then we will place a sticker such as this one on your craft uh, to show uh, if so if you get stopped by uh, you know the, the authorities because um, they also do there are areas that have uh, conservation police and, and uh, sheriff's offices have marine units that will do safety checks on you. But most of the time they see these, they know you've, you're serious and you've, you've taken, taken the time to uh, have your, your vessel check. Um, but the three things we look for is the soundness of your craft. All right, we turn it over, we look at it inside and out to make sure there's no crack, dents, uh, stuff that can actually where water can, can leak in. Um, uh, as it sounds that we found some stuff on people's boats before they went in the water. Um, number two, we make sure that they have a serviceable life jacket. Okay, so each each you know year, check it out. Make sure the snaps work. Make sure the zippers work. Make sure it's, there's no holes in it. Um, and if there are, replace it. Um, and do not cheap out. Um, you wouldn't ask for the you know, go to a place and ask for the cheapest uh, parachute to go skydiving, and you really don't want to go with the cheapest life jacket. Uh, this is something that can actually end up saving your life. So um, buying something that is a little bit better quality uh, is always the way to go. And uh, always look to see, make sure that it's U.S. Coast Guard approved. And then we look to see if you have a sound device. And if you have those, you can, you will pass our exam. Well, we also go and look at and say, you know what, this is something that, that you should check, you know, to check into getting, you know, and some people will have it, some people won't. Uh, but by us bringing it to our attention, it, it, it makes them think and, you know, to, to be prepared, okay, to, uh, you know, they may have to help themselves or help somebody else out uh, one day. But you can uh, request it or you can follow uh, us on our, our various uh, um, uh, social media platforms. Now, our flotilla 3725, if you just search on Facebook, uh, you can follow us and, um, and we put on there where we're going to be at. Uh, usually starting right around April 1st, we'll start getting out and, and hitting the places and, and doing blitz, vessel check blitzes. And, you know, we'll be out there in force and, um, you know, takes probably about 10, 15 minutes for you to get a, a, a vessel safety check. These are the various uh, resources, these uh, wikis that uh, you can use. And, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, it's strict uh, for the auxiliary and also the American Canoe Association. Both are great references uh, for paddle craft, uh, you know, as far as well, what's required, what's needed. Um, the ACA offers a wide variety of uh, uh, courses and very reasonably priced. They even have some that'll, uh, they have instructors out there that will uh, show you how to get back into your canoe or kayak uh, should you have uh, an emergency swim. So, uh, yeah. oh, thank you. Um, so, um, the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the ACA had uh, entered into a memorandum of agreement that we work together to promote safety in, the, in paddle craft. So, uh, we are constantly relying on them and, um, uh, and hopefully they us and um, it's, it's, it's a good partnership. Mm -hmm.